and welcome to our 12-part series on the table with the Green Party. I'm Jennifer Sullivan, and I'm a longtime member of the Green Party. Some of you may not have heard of the Green Party, but we are a legitimate political party in the state of Florida and the United States of America. In fact, we are the farthest reaching political party in the world in 93 countries. Here in the USA, the media is mostly controlled by massive amounts of money. Greens do not accept corporate or special interest PAC funds, and with, but with the uh, citizens' First Amendment means of the internet and public access media, we can be found and heard from. We'd like to thank Tampa Bay Cable Network and the City of Tampa for allowing the free speech of our voice. We're grateful to have three guests who will speak of their experience with our topic for today, peace. Dr. Michael Knox from the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation, Betty, Joe, and Delicato representing the International Women's Peace Service, Brian Moore, Nature Coast Peace and Justice Coalition. Okay, um, we're going to hear more from them, but first I'd like to read excerpts from the Green Party political platform. Democracy. Our nation was born as the first great experience in modern democracy. We seek to rescue that heritage from the erosion of citizen participation. The power of civic action is an antidote to the corporate control of so much of our lawmaking and regulating. We strongly feel that our country should view itself as a member of the community of nations, not above it. The United States could well play a leadership role in that community, but only if we become committed to an eco-social vision of peace, national self-determination, and international cooperation. Okay. Greens support sustainable development and social economic justice across the globe, restricting global corporatization which concentrates greater power in the hands of fewer interests and reducing militarism and reliance on arms policies are the keys to progress towards collective security. Peace and disarmament. The United States must support the United Nations and abide by its treaties and resolutions. We seek to repeal the UN Security Council veto power, <coughs> sign on to the International Criminal Court, declare no first strike and no preemptive war policies, reject invasion, and occupation, abolish nuclear weapons, and biological and chem chemical warfare, and close foreign military bases, close the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, formerly known as the School of Americas, prohibit arms sales to other countries, and discontinue foreign aid used for military purposes. Middle East peace, we reaffirm the right of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes in Israel. We call for the suspension of aid to Israel until it withdraws from the occupied territories, dismantles the separation wall, and ends its siege, siege of Gaza. Okay, now I would just like to again <coughs> welcome you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, Michael Knox, we'll start with you. Can you right. tell us a little bit about your Peace Foundation project? Well, thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me. I'm going to talk about the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation, which we established in 2005 as a 501c3 not-for-profit public charity. Uh, for, for the last eight years, the foundation has directed a nationwide <coughs> effort to recognize peace leadership by publishing the U.S. Peace Registry, awarding an annual peace prize, and planning for the U.S. Peace Memorial in Washington, D.C. These projects help move us toward a, a culture of peace as we honor the millions of thoughtful and courageous Americans who have taken a public stand against one or more U.S. wars, or who have devoted their time, energy, and other resources to finding peaceful solutions to international conflict. We celebrate these role models in hopes of inspiring other Americans to speak out against war and for peace. The U.S. has a long history of waging war, from the Native American nations decimated by the U.S. Army, to recent bombings and drone attacks on tribal areas in Pakistan and neighborhoods in Libya and Yemen. <laughs> Since the end of World War II, the U.S. has invaded more than 20 nations, killing millions of people. We prioritize funding for war, overspending on education, health care, medical research, and everything else that can have a positive impact on quality of life. This is my thesis, the one reason the U.S. wages so many wars <coughs> is because few Americans speak out against them. 
Can you imagine what an impact it would have if 1% of the population went to the next anti-war demonstration? Most Americans consider those who fought for civil rights to be heroes. What if those who demand peace were also appreciated? What if 1% of the voters contacted their members in Congress asking for an end to a particular US war? What if Americans voted for anti-war candidates? All of these actions would have an impact. I want to tell you about our project. Should I continue yeah, about the various aspects? Yeah. Children are taught that soldiers are heroes and role models. And of course, soldiers are revered on television, at sporting events, educational events, at civic so ceremonies in various cities. And while soldiers are told that it's honorable to fight and die for one's country, peace activists are often labeled as un-American, unpatriotic, or anti-military. We often hold in derision those who call for peaceful alternatives to war. So it's no wonder that few Americans speak out against war. The U.S. Peace Memorial exists to serve as a reminder that Americans value peace, and we can increase the number of people who speak out against war and advocate peaceful solutions. In terms of honoring peace leadership, we published the U.S. Peace Registry to recognize individuals and organizations that have opposed military solutions and promoted peace. <clears throat> From the U.S. Peace Registry, Every year, we choose one person to be listed as our Peace Prize recipient. Cindy Sheehan was awarded that prize in 2009 in recognition of her extraordinary and innovative anti-war activism. Congressman Dennis Kucinich in 2010 in recognition of his national leadership to prevent and aid and end wars. Noam Chomsky in 2011 in recognition of his anti-war activities. Medea Benjamin in 2012 in recognition of her creative leadership on the front lines of the anti-war movement. And in 2013, Bradley Manning for conspicuous bravery at the risk of his own freedom above and beyond the call of duty. So I've told you about the Peace Registry and the Peace Prize. Our final project is to actually build a peace monument, the U.S. Peace Memorial. And we'd love to hear more about that. And so, and, I, and I thank you so much. Um, Betty Jo. Hi, my name is Betty Jo and Delicato, and I volunteer with the International Women's Peace Service. We work in Palestine, um, assisting the Palestinians <coughs> in their daily struggle against the Israeli occupation. Um, I have also worked with Voices in the Wilderness, uh, where we were in Iraq during um, the First and Second Gulf War. And our job there was to try to give a face to the Iraqi people, because at that time, the US media only portrayed Iraq as Saddam Hussein. And in fact, um, Iraq was a, a very beautiful world. and. Um, so we tried to bring those images home to people so that they would understand uh, we're not bombing Saddam Hussein, we're bombing civilians. Um, and so um, usually when I talk uh, in, um, to groups of people, I'm talking about on the ground um, conflict experiences. And today now I'm here asked to talk about how we can make our government more responsible for peace. And um, I was actually filled with happiness on my way here today, uh, thinking about that we're talking about solutions. Yes. Um, not that people haven't been, but I haven't had that opportunity quite as much. Um, and I'm grateful for it. Thank you. Um, so we talk about how we can make our government more responsible for peace. Um, but I ask if we can change the government until we actually change ourselves in our local communities. And I just want to uh, um, look at some paradigms that I think keeps us from being a society of peace that would demand a government of peace. One, um, well, we are conditioned to a status quo that has brought us <coughs> to the brink of self-annihilation. No other creature on the planet has destroyed itself. 
but we humans have. It's social insanity. One thing I, I see is individualism over collectivism. Um, we have this rugged individualism. Uh, we can take care of ourselves. People should be able to take care of themselves. When in actuality, coming together makes us so much stronger. As we knew when, back when we had strong unions, the collective bargaining. Um, and, and as a, an example of um, the individualism being celebrated in this country, I think of that show, Doomsday Preppers. These are people who, who understand that we are headed to self-annihilation, and they're building bunkers and stuff so they can take care of only their own, mm -hmm. only their own. And everybody watches this show, and it's celebrated. Where are the shows that talk about people building community gardens and free schools and um, all the, the wonderful things that we, we also understand that we're headed to self-annihilation and are looking at community efforts um, to come together and, and, and stop, stop, stop the train we're on right now. Uh, another one is competition over cooperation. And there's this beautiful saying um, about a South African word, Ubuntu. And it's a, a story about an anthropologist who make, has a basket of fruit. And he shows it to the children, and he places it uh, a distance away. And he said the first one to get the fruit, get to the fruit, um, gets all of it. The children took hands and all ran together. And so the anthropologist asked them, why did you do this? Why did you not, um, you know, one person tried to get it all? And the children responded, Ubuntu. And it means that if one of us are hungry, all of us are hungry. Um, and the next thing is conformity over creativity. We, our society, the society that is um, is enslaving us, demands conformity. And, and it's a horrible way to say it. We're feeding our, our children into a society that demands a conformity that is going to kill them. Okay, thank you. That's, that was great. Ubuntu. Oh. I'm, a, as a, I'm the coordinator of the Nature Coast Coalition, which is a, a peace group. And uh, I'm also the vice chair of the uh, Peace and Freedom Party, which is a socialist party based in California and has uh, spread to Florida and Colorado. And I'm the vice chair here in Florida, and I'm an active socialist. But <clears throat> I try to integrate these ideas into uh, the efforts uh, with the community. Our Nature Coast Coalition for Peace and Justice was formed in 2002. Prior to the start of the Iraq War, and we came out uh, and demonstrated against uh, Congress's uh, pending vote to give the p authority to the president to uh, go to war. We were subject to vigilance by the local sheriff's office and uh, uh, they conducted covert uh, surveillance of us, which we were able to uncover through the uh, ACLU uh, a year or two later. They had photos and videos and everything else. This was a forerunner, I guess, of the NSA and state, uh, yeah. so forth. We are made up of, uh, our group is made up of Democrats and Republicans and independents and third party uh, people, as well as uh, nonpartisan people, people that are concerned about our society and concerned about what uh, Michael and uh, Betty Jo uh, echoed as to uh, our, what is happening in our society. Uh, we have people from Pasco, Hernando, Citrus counties. We joined forces in public demonstrations on the streets with St. Pete for Peace, uh, Marion County uh, peace activists, as well as the Citrus County as well. Uh, we're concerned about our society being very militaristic, uh, even becoming a police state, and our loss of of our liberties and our and our freedoms. We some of us were opposed to the Vietnam War many years ago and we continued uh, that uh, effort uh, when we went to war in Iraq on Iraq War 1 and Iraq 2. 
We've opposed Afghanistan. We've opposed the saber rattling with Iran. We're concerned about the Middle East uh, uh, activities uh, and also Israelis' occupation of uh, Palestine lands. We've come out and opposed the drones, both internationally and the use of drones domestically, and their assassinating of uh, innocent civilians as well as our own citizens. We've opposed the Patriot Act and the military tribunal laws and liberties. We've opposed our country's use of torture and rendition. And we've come out against the NSA and the CIA and AID and the, the use of our intelligence agencies around the globe. We're also concerned about 700 United States military bases and we advocate uh, and urge our country to reconsider their policies and to withdraw the not only the uh, economic burden but the bellicose burden of causing anger and hatred toward America and threatening our freedoms and our liberties and our safety because of our covert and aggressive and overt actions. We've opposed nuclear power, the Cuban embargo. We've participated in the Occupy movement. We've opposed corporate power and its use of money on our uh, political representatives and the two-party control, uh, the decadent two-party system that is rotten to the core and is cr creating uh, a widening gap and a loss of a fair distribution of monies in our society and it's creating poverty and violence and social upheaval. And if it doesn't change, we believe that social upheaval will result because of uh, what is occurring in our country. And basically that's uh, where we're coming from, our group. Okay, okay, well, um, strong statements by all. Um, I guess that's one of the things, we just, we just ended a holiday season where <coughs> the major religions all talk of peace on earth. An example from the Bible, <coughs> Romans 12, 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I'm inspired by these words, but whether someone's a practicing Christian or not, someone will come up to you and cite an extreme example like, yeah, what if someone's got a gun to your wife's head or is hurting your child or mother? What are you going to do? Flash a peace sign and negotiate? Do you have, you have any comments on that? <laughs> no, you're smiling. <laughs> well, I would say that that example is an imminent threat. <clears throat> the United States goes to war for a variety of reasons, but never an imminent threat, in my opinion. Since the end of World War II, we've invaded 20 countries. We bombed 20 different countries. and there's no reason to think that any of these countries were really a threat against the, the superpower of the United States of America. So that kind of example is an eminent threat. Obviously, we need to defend our country, we need to defend our families and neighborhoods, but we should not be invading other people's countries. Okay, Betty, and, and we'll just, go, yeah, you had something. Well, um, I certainly agree um, and would also say that if we're, in, we're living in a situation of violence where um, violence is rampant or, you know, I assume, you know, there's a robbery taking place or something in this circumstance. Mm -hmm. right. um, well, maybe it is the system that is, is in charge of the violence. Um, we live in a system where people are without food, they're without health care, they're without a place to sleep. And oftentimes, that is where our violence lays, and we don't take care of, of our mentally ill. And education. Yes. Um, so, I, and this feeds the, the school to prison pipeline. So, um, I think, yes, there, there are times perhaps when force is necessary. I, I, I hold pacifism very dear. Um, I think we all do here, <laughs> but mm -hmm. yes, okay. And it, now, Brian, you had something. Well, I don't think force uh, ultimately wins out, uh, whether it's on a local basis or on an international basis. And that's why we're trying to change the economic system in our country. And uh, the profit motive and greed has motivated uh, 
uh, our, and designed our foreign policy because corporations have bought off the congressmen. And we've acted in basically to protect our corporate and moneyed interests and as a result have caused violence. So if we can change the economic system, we can make it a more socialized system and have base our economy on, on uh, services and products that are beneficial to our society, then that will be the long-term solution to any degree of violence, whether it be in the inner city, on the neighborhood corner, or over in Afghanistan. And I have to say this, when, when the word like social, it, when someone doesn't like the word socialism, it seems like why, um, are you anti-social? <laughs> so I mean, I, a lot of these words have been given like bad connotations, like liberal. Liberal actually means that you're giving, that you're you know open to things. Um, so I mean, it's just, just a lot of words that have been twisted. It's by pro. It's pro community. Pro, as Betty Jo said, collective. You know, it's demo democratic. Okay, it's participatory amongst everyone, as mm -hmm. opposed to this singular small group at the top that makes decisions and imposes their will on many people. Yeah, and um, wars over economic, and we were kind of talking about this, as wars over the interests of economic um, interests of multinational companies. Um, is it an act of peace to send in an economic hitman, to negotiate with despots, to steal resources from the citizens of the nation, which is what's happened in a lot of places. Any comments on that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> is that an act of I mean, peace? Can we find a better alternative? Let's put it that I, way. I don't know, but I, the actual peace memorial will be covered with quotations from famous Americans, quotations that will uh, shock people into understanding we have hundreds of years of American heroes who have spoken out against war. The students are just not taught in school. And, and I was going to read some of those mm -hmm. quotes, but one that oh. I wasn't going to read uh, but I crossed out here, it's from Ronald Reagan, <laughs> of all, all people, who said, no mother would ever willingly sacrifice her sons for territorial gain, for economic advantage, or for ideology. And of course, that's what the United States does. We sacrifice our sons and daughters for these things. And that was the original Mother's Day was about. It was an anti-war mm -hmm. group of mothers. Yes. yes. So I think that's the best gift that you could give a mother is to keep her children alive, her <coughs> sons and daughters. And I would also like to say that um, in the spirit of collectivism, when we send an economic hitman to a country to rape their, their earth, we're raping our own earth too. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to realize that at some point there's nothing left. Uh, and oh, that malignant consumerism your husband was saying earlier? <laughs> yes, exactly. I think I... Comment on that, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I addressed it earlier, so I'm not right, going to be I, redundant. I think, <laughs> right, well, I, that's, I got it, pulled that off of what you were saying, <laughs> okay. so yeah. Um, okay, um, as an environmentalist, because you're talking about that type of thing, it's, it's like I, I find that war games, I find them disturbing. And the munitions, the depleted uranium, uh, they pepper every place that we've invaded, as well as where we practice, such as Vieques, Puerto Rico. Uh, one has to wonder, how many places did we invade just for practice, war games, uh, Central America, the war on drugs in Colombia? Any comments there? Um, yes, well, I actually had the experience of working with a children's hospital um, in Iraq um, children who were, um, had cancer from depleted uranium. And that was from the first Gulf War, and this was in 2003. And I, I, can't, I can't bring myself to talk about it much because, you know, I just can't right now. Heartbreaking. But it is heartbreaking. And that depleted uranium was dropped in Basra, okay? And uh, it was something like, um, a thousand tons of depleted uranium over Basra, which is a large, it's a mostly southern Iraq. Mm -hmm. They uh, used a hundred more <coughs> times depleted uranium on Baghdad. Uh, so you can just imagine what is going to happen to generations of Iraqis through that depleted uranium. And I also, um, the, we give $3 billion a year to Israel for their military defense. And Israel is actually 
advertising that they use the demonstrations in the West Bank to test out their new military equipment. So, okay. So they use it on people they consider the other. <coughs> Yes, Not civilian, Israeli. unarmed yeah. civilian population. Yeah. And is that, a, is that all? Yeah, Palestinians. Are Palestinians, everyone in Palestine, are they Muslim? Are they no. Christian? What's, is there a mix? What? There's a mix. Uh, there's um, uh, Muslim and Christian. And I'm very glad that you asked that question because I think it is so important for Americans to understand, and, and especially Ameri American Christians, that there are Palestinian Christians and they are treated no better by the Israeli occupation forces. Their houses are demolished. They are, um, you know, uh, harmed, injured, um, jailed, imprisoned for um, no crimes. And um, many Christians in this, in this country seem to think that it is a Christian duty to support Israel, when actually supporting Israel is um, killing and Christian Palestinians and demolishing their homes and taking their livelihood. Could I, yes. uh, just briefly, I think that we really should be uh, emphasizing solar and hydro uh, power as opposed to fossil fuel dependency. Mm -hmm. And I also think that public ownership of public utilities will also be able to have a more positive impact upon the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, public transportation is an indirect effect on uh, the environment. And even ending our nuclear testing and the toxic waste dumping on reservation lands, Indian lands, to the mm -hmm. creation of landfills in poor communities, of, especially of color, and just eliminating all these, uh, these uh, nuclear waste uh, locations that they hope to have or plan to have, whether it be in the ocean bottom or even in Nevada or anywhere else. Well, yeah, and those are excellent points, Brian. I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. I don't think people think of war as doing things like that. I think they just think of it's, okay, us against them, we, can, we need to win. We, and, but that's one of the aspects of it, a, a major aspect. And we're going to be showing uh, future shows about you know, solutions to environmental, you know, and to uh, cleaner environment and opposed to a nuclear, the dangers of nuclear and so on because, it's, you know, that's, I mean, some people aren't even aware of like the, the Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi, yeah. the, the impact of that <clears throat> coming over, but I mean, it's just, but this, the war games themselves are, you know, participatory in putting these things, you know, out there and it's, it's our planet. It's all our planet. It may be, we can say, oh, it's over there. It's in another country. We don't have to worry about it. But you know what? It does go into our atmosphere. It does affect the climate. Well, not only that, how about both major parties have supported our withdrawal of signing the Kyoto, what is Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol. Wrote, yeah, right. the treaty, yeah. I mean, you know, That's 138 countries have signed it. And uh, both political parties have, you know, uh, backed off from it, refused to sign it, and then we claim to be so environmentally concerned. Uh, yeah, 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 what's so wrong about being, you know, <coughs> kind and doing good <laughs> things and, you know, preserving the planet and making it livable for everyone? You know, um, that's, that's what I, I, I find that sometimes, you know... Well, there's big money involved here, yes. whether it be nuclear plants or weapons, uh, selling of weapons overseas or you know, these, uh, the use of fossil fuel uh, vehicles and it just goes on and on and on, you know. Yeah. So. Well, I, you know, going back to that too, I, th I think of the film Straw Dogs where, you know, this peaceful character, Dustin Hoffman, this is an older film, but it's mm -hmm. still a good one. He's driven to extreme measures to defend his family. And I think defense is understandable, but military bases all over the world, it just, how does that really help in, in waging peace. I have read that there is the only time there have been suicide bombers have been from countries that are occupied, that are under occupation or have, like you said, the military um, bases in their countries, uh, you know, which is a form of occupation. Well, I mean, yes. how, free, how free can a country feel when um, there is a whole city of 
um, army bases and yeah, I mean, it's like Rafael Correa from uh, Ecuador said. <laughs> he said uh, they, we, he was asked if they could put a military base in Ecuador, and he said, "Well, yeah, when well, we can put one in Miami." It's like I guess that's the <laughs> point of view. Is like it's, it's, I, I thought that was a great answer because, like you know, it's, what's fair for one person should be fair for the other. It, this where we have this, um, you know, American exceptionalism. But yeah. it looked like you wanted to say something. Like, well, it is American <laughs> exceptionalism idea. You know, we. We criticize other countries. We say use chemical weapons. But of course, we're the biggest user of chemical weapons, mm -hmm. the depleted uranium, the napalm, the Agent Orange, and a variety of things that are classified we don't even know about. And we, you know, we complain about biological weapons. We have more biological weapons than any other country. Mm -hmm. Countries can't develop nuclear weapons, but we have no more nuclear weapons than all of the other countries combined that have nuclear weapons. Here, we need to lead by example, rather than prohibiting countries or criticizing countries for doing exactly what we do, we should stop doing those things and lead by example. Good points. If the U.S. simply maintained a defense military, how would that change the world? I'd like to ask each one of you if you have a thought on that. Um, we'll start with you, Brian. Well, uh, sub substantially, I mean, uh, because uh, it would be, become more social. The world would be better off, I think, socially. A lot of uh, our, the, our presence and our aggressive uh, uh, protections of economic interests uh, have created this animosity and this hatred. I'm going to cover an area here which is a little delicate, but I just get it off my chest. America really it has invested in the military. We are a military, militaristic society. Every week there's a celebration or a parade uh, of, for military or, and I understand that uh, and appreciate some of the uh, investment of, of people's lives. And uh, for example, m I had five uncles in World War II. They were all in the military. My father was in the Navy. Right. And, and I'm very World grateful for that. But uh, we've become so militaristic uh, and the corporations have been smart in, in breaking up their, their plants into all 435 congressional districts so that there's an economic pressure on congressmen to, to always back uh, the retention of a base or the development of uh, submarines or whatever. I mean, even mm -hmm. McDill Air Force Base here in mm -hmm. Tampa you know, the newspapers won't say a darn critical thing about it, and yet uh, here again, uh, it's, uh, it's just too much of an emphasis. It's patriotism to a fault. Patriotism can be res being responsible for your community. Mm -hmm. It can be developing and improving upon products and <laughs> services that benefit society. That's patriotic. It's not a used car dealership putting a big flag up on US 19 and saying I'm patriotic. <laughs> Good point. Or it's even another thing, I have a, you know, another thing. They're giving <coughs> veterans preference regarding jobs. Or everywhere there's a preference for veterans. Well, what about the, the blue collar worker? What about mm -hmm. the unemployed guy, mm -hmm. you know, that for some reason maybe didn't volunteer to go into the military? Or the pacifist, that, right. It's, right. It's, it's, so yes. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, it's not a fair, equal society. Right. And, uh, and so we're worshiping the warrior. Exactly. And uh, yeah, yeah. And the, the, but those are good points. I think we should revisit that about the, um, the economic aspect because, I mean, really, that's, they, they weigh this thing like it's jobs. Well, jobs could be putting up clean energy, rebuilding our infrastructure, investing, reinvesting the money in this country, and we could have a real lot of jobs, great jobs, and, you know, sure. jobs with a future. And so I want to ask Michael, do you have a response to the, um, you know, the USA simply maintained a defense military? How would that change the world in your opinion? Well, we would have huge resources to do good. We would have, we spend 60 or more percent of our budget on war and we borrow most of that money. So we're in debt. Our grandchildren and great grandchildren will all be paying the price of these wars. So the big dividend is the money that can be used for good, for education, for medical research, for health care throughout the world, and lead by example, as I say, do good instead of evil. Yeah. Yeah, there's no post-traumatic stress with peace. So, 
Good point. Do you, got, do you have a response to that, Betty? Um, well, I think it's simply just the right thing to do. Okay. Nah. And, and I think it would give a, a change to the U.S. mindset. Um, <clears throat> it would redefine patriotism. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, um, we could invest in our economy, you know, in infrastructure and things. But most importantly to me, um, we could go to bed at night knowing that there are not American drones flying over villages and killing innocent children, civilians. Um, I would sleep better if I knew that my country was not involved in such rogue terrorism. Well, and, and you've been in other countries. And I, I guess that's saying, how would it change the world in, in this question? I'm just, it, how would that change the world in your opinion, like their opinion of us, their, their view of us? Well, you know, I mean, strate well, yeah. strategically, I mean, my God, it would be a difference between night and day. You know, it makes sense. But things that make sense don't, don't you know, <laughs> they don't work in the United States of America. You know, again, they, it's the money, yeah. it's the economic interests, it's the greed, it's the power or the grab for power. I mean, even these political parties, they will put party and power over principle and over well, the interests sometimes yes. of the welfare of the people. And that's why, well, how can we have poverty in America? Yes, and that's the thing. It's like if we do the, the right thing is defined as like how much profit and how much you can make out of that and how, you know, in right. a financial sense. Oh, they don't a, look at the profit of like how many lives were enriched, mm -hmm. how many people weren't put out of their homes, how many people have jobs and a future, how many people have k children that are educated in a fair manner to you know to what, what everyone else can afford mm -hmm. to do. I love that example with the children holding hands and having that aspect because when you do look into anthropology, the the, the rich, you know people lived in groups and they supported their tribe and it was like they work together and they didn't look at, like it wasn't like one person running ahead and doing this one person might run ahead because they were a fast runner and you know sp spread the news everyone did their like their their you know what what they could do they might have had a warrior to go out you know the ones that in case they were invaded they might have had someone you know to gather food but everyone did their their share and in their according to their capacity and we have a kind of a, a judgmental thing in this country to where like if you know win or take all and if you win everyone else is a loser and it's right. like you can't we need to actually look at it like when one you know i think it was michael um michael Prenny that said you know that that a rising tide you know can raise all all the um the uh, boats or something like that and he said well actually a, a rising tide if it's like a rising tide for just the wealthy the one percent or the even mm -hmm. less than one percent said that'll sink a lot of ships so. well but they're digging <laughs> their own grave jennifer that this ultimately is going to end in societal upheaval and we are peacemakers okay mm -hmm. we are the ones that are nonviolent. We trying are the to say ones, stop we are trying to avoid that but the way our society is functioning it is inevitable that and that's why we're out organizing in the streets mm -hmm. and in the in the in the, uh, the unions and even in the military. It's because the the top one percent have confiscated all this money, and they're blind to what they're creating. They're mm -hmm. creating suffering, and it's it's going to blow up in their faces. A global plantation. And and Michael, I I think you you've got a whole different mindset on this as far as like how we could change this paradigm and to, to look for a peace memorial. Well, and how would that change other countries' it's part aspect of it's, and view it's of part us? of educating American citizens mm -hmm. first okay. about our rich history of Americans who have spoken out against war. And we're doing that through the U.S. Peace Registry where mm -hmm. people in everyday lives, who maybe they wrote a letter to the editor in opposition to the invasion of Panama or Grenada mm -hmm. or Afghanistan, or maybe they wrote to their member of Congress or maybe they demonstrated at, at a military base that was about to send troops to invade uh, Iraq. So those are everyday people, but we also want to recognize our history. So the monument will have quotations from famous Americans, from George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Martin Luther King. I have a few I'd like to read that Please. we think that they will be shocking to people when Americans see that their heroes 
uh, said something that was anti-war. Wait and that maybe peace. this shock <laughs> will, will help them to understand that it's patriotic to speak out against war. Peace is patriotic. I believe so that. So there's I think a we quote from do. Benjamin Franklin. There never was a good war or a bad peace. Albert Einstein, this will, will really uh, shock people. It is my conviction that killing under the cloak of war is nothing but an act of murder. Helen Keller, strike against war, for without you, no battles can be fought. In other words, without the soldiers mm -hmm. and the complicity of the American people. Mm -hmm. uh, Margaret Mead, we must devise a system in which peace is more rewarding than war. And that's what we've been talking about, mm -hmm. the economic advantage. Mm -hmm. And so I think the memorial, when it is built, will help everyone to understand, educate everyone about about that and we hope that we can encourage people to get involved to become founding members to look at our website uspeacememorial.org and maybe try some of these anti-war behaviors that you'll see documented on the website try them yourself encourage others to be involved and most importantly honor those who speak out against war recognize them and honor them and Last, I'd just like to close with, with a quote from President Kennedy, which could have been the impetus for our project. War will exist until that distant day when the conscientious objector enjoys the same reputation and prestige that the warrior does today. Yes, very good. And I think when people do look at your website, they find that because a lot of things in life today, in these modern times, very stressful, very pressure, very high pressure and quick moving. Thing. I think when they look at your, your page, they will ex actually experience peace. And that's, that's a, the big thing, is to kind of get that mindset of like, we don't have to go back to ancient times and, and, you know, and get rid of modern technology to enjoy peace and to change that mindset. We can definitely do it, and it's a better, it's, a, it's actually a more progressive, a safer, and a, a, it actually peace, with peace, there's a future. With war, there's not a there's not a future. So I think being peaceful is a just a, a smart thing to do. <laughs> so okay, um, well, let's see. Um, and I guess it's something that you brought up that um, you know peace is patriotic and things like that. But um, how would you answer people who say, if you're critical of the USA, why don't you live in Iraq or somewhere? Um, we might get bombed <laughs> by the <laughs> yeah. USA. It's dangerous. <laughs> you know, but yeah. we were all born here, right? Yeah. We're all citizens Absolutely. of this country. It's a very comfortable country to live in. But I worry sometimes that many Americans don't travel enough to other parts of the world to understand that there also are other very good places to mm -hmm. live mm -hmm. and different ways of approaching government and community. And it's uh, the people who travel internationally, I think, understand that better. The United States is not superior in every way to every country. And the exceptionalism that we claim, that our president claims, is not appropriate. Yeah, and it's not to say that we're like, you know, a bad country or anything like that. It's just to say that we are, our emphasis is on um, consumerism, consumption. We consume more than most countries. I mean, I think it's, isn't that uh, the statistics maybe like we consume as much as the right. rest of the world Material, combined and more? Time. Right, oh, and okay. so, but yes, and when you do go to other countries, you realize that they subsist on a lot, and if their lifestyle is great, they're healthier, they, you know, they right. have public they transportation, live they live longer. They have better health and, systems. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and and what, what we're doing is actually we're acting like, yeah, we've got all this stuff, and we're sitting here on these big cushions and enjoying large, large homes instead of a smaller place to live and, sit, and feel like that's, oh, we've really arrived. And actually, we're a lot of times just killing ourselves with the, so I, I think you were going to I was just going to say, when I, when I return from a from, um, place like Palestine or but. Uh, it is a shock to the senses. From you know, you drive out of the airport and you you see all of the manifestations of the malignant consumerism, and uh, it's it takes like it takes a while to get used to it again, because you're in a country that is not uh, living to to grab more. Yes, they're they're striving to live. 
And it, at my experience with people, when I've been in the Middle East, in the countries where there's Muslims, they're very peaceful, they're very quiet, they're very friendly, they're very shy, they're, you know, they're generous. And um, so I just think the picture that's painted of Muslims in general, or Arabs, or, you know, not all Arabs and Muslims are the same thing or anything, I'm not saying that, but, but I mean, that picture is, is a tainted picture. Could you, know, you imagine propaganda? Could you imagine uh, going to any um, any little neighborhood in the United States, and everybody opens their doors and says, "Oh, please come in for tea." <laughs> and that's you go to a village yes. in Palestine, Welcome, and yes. you know you're going to have ten cups of tea before you leave. <laughs> <laughs> and we used to have that, though. I'm I'm old enough to remember when we did have that. <laughs> so, Brian, you want to say something? Well, about? only that uh, I traveled south as opposed mm -hmm. to east and west. Mm -hmm. I lived in most countries in Latin America, and the two countries where uh, Same thing, though. <laughs> I was in the Peace Corps. We were under military control in Panama and Peru. At that time, there were military uh, dictatorships that, that controlled society. So on every corner, there was a National Guardsman with a machine gun or in, every, in front of every bank. So uh, I'm aware that sometimes you don't have liberties and, and, and freedoms uh, there that you don't hear. But on the other hand, they, they were cultures that were more personable and they respected each other more dearly. And whether it be a person's birthday or somebody that come to the house or helping their neighbor, hands down, Latin Americans have uh, it over uh, Americans, uh, mm -hmm. North Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But you know, I wanna make a point too though about uh, the conformity issue that Betty Jo mentioned. You know, the press and the media, I find them at fault for a lot of our ills that they are uh, part of the establishment, they're part of the status quo, they're subject to the big money and interests, and they're, they're, I feel that they've been cowardly about uh, raising the issues, challenging uh, power, uh, and trying to, uh, you know, change uh, the ills of our society. You know, you've got a great point there, and I would say that the United States, it, right now we are so under this, that the media, you can blame them, they're trying to keep their jobs, because it's just like, that's their sponsors. They have to try to get someone to sponsor their paper and pay for the, you know, to their employees and so on, so they have to go to these large corporations. And that's who they're going to be dominated by. If you have someone that's doing a full page ad, you know, spread on your Sunday paper, you can't have someone writing, the editor is going to go, wow, we really can't write an article telling the truth about this, you know, store. And we not, might guess which store that is. But anyway, there's plenty of these, the large multinational corporations or this product <clears throat> or whatever, whoever is sending that money in. And I, but I, that's I, why it's so important for us to be doing what we're doing in uh, the streets, this, in the yes, classrooms, in the you know, in the jobs, yeah, agitating, pushing, educating. criticizing, speaking out, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, trying to deal with and tell, telling people that it's it's not that difficult to do it, and you're yeah. not wrong. You're right, and we'll support you. Yes, and, we'll and, back and, that's, you and up. that's where I was going to go with that is the fact that we should be more supportive of the independent media mm -hmm. that is not taking money from those sources because that's how we can wage peace right there. If we support, like, you know, alternative news sources, independent news sources of any kind, mm -hmm. and we can list some here, but I mean, like, a, for instance, Democracy Now! is a good show. Um, yeah, but you know, it, means, it means going after the corporations, though. Right. You know, going on strike or demonstrating in front of them, embarrassing them, showing them up. I mean, I mean Ralph Nader it. wrote a letter the other day to uh, some some corporation that's been in hiding that's never criticizes the top three everybody criticizes yes. walmart and uh, target and uh, you know some of the other yeah the big corporations and he said well, what are you you're, you're paying minimum wage to your your, your yes. employees and yet your ceo makes 23 million dollars a year yeah and that's you know? that's and that's and they're anti-union and, and things like that so and and brian you're right i mean but you're, it takes an activist i mean a lot of it we're activists we will speak out we will you know make make the time to do a lot of these things, but we're talking about like the average person, and I think if the average person wants to help out, that's one way, is they can give, give to independent news, and they will get independent news. So that's, that was just my point, and Betty, you just want to say, Betty Jo. Um, well, I just want to say for the individual person, uh, a lot of times it looks like we're doing something special that other people can't, mm. and 
It's, it's simply we're doing a particular way of peacemaking, which is neither greater nor lesser than any other type. And everybody can be involved in peacemaking. Mm -hmm. Everybody. The mother who's at home, um, that just everybody, just uh, simple acts of kindness mm -hmm. to change our society. Get to know your neighbors. Knock on doors. It's find easy. out. Find out who lives next door to you. Is it somebody who who is disabled or elderly or lonely? These are the kind of things that can change change really who we are as a people. And and it's not it's it's. There's nothing glorious about it, but it's saintliness. Yeah, you know? and it's the old saying of it takes less uh, muscles to smile than to frown. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy. <laughs> Did you want to say something, Michael, to that? No, no, oh, I don't. No? <laughs> okay, do you have something I should else? smile more. Do you have another? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, we look, sometimes it think that everything seems so dire and so serious, yeah. but we can also enjoy our lives, and we can also find our ways to, to peace that we enjoy. It doesn't have to be, mm -hmm. if you find something that you like doing, if it's writing letters to the editor, or if it's going to a, a county meeting, or if it's helping children, whatever you do, don't feel like, oh, I haven't contributed enough. Contributing is, is is the main thing, and do things that you like. Um, again, my say, this one saying I like to, Gil Scott Heron said, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, don't, don't, people shouldn't measure themselves like I'm inadequate because I have not gone on TV or I have not, you know, traveled to another country, I can't afford it or whatever it is. It's like, um, you can still, by reading books, you can get, you know, things like this. The library is there, it's a public resource, it's a wonderful resource, supporting that supports peace. Um, because it supports education, the more people, the more minds are expanded. Um, but that um, just just reminds me of Nelson Mandela, who passed and was a, a great voice for unity and peace. And he said, "For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others." Okay. We're about ready to wrap. I don't want anyone to feel like they didn't get a chance to say everything they wanted to say. Do you feel like you got everything in that you wanted to bring up? Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. Do you want to bring US up uspeacememorial.org is a place to get more information. Okay, and if, if you um, are thinking of somewhere to put your money, that would be a, a good spot to invest, to, <laughs> yes. to help wage peace. And to build the actual monument, which of course yes. is very expensive. Yes. And it has to compete with, with monuments to wartime presidents and to wars and the people who have died in wars, and there are very few examples in Washington, D.C. I think that's what I, I remember you speaking about that once before. You went with your son, and you were looking yeah, at and, exactly, and you saw exactly. all these war memorials. And, and then we saw individual statues where the person depicted as holding a pistol or a rifle or a bow and arrow or a sword or a spear or the statue is surrounded with cannons. Uh, it's, it's very hard to find anything that would in any way show that the United States supports peace and peacemakers. They do have Martin Luther King Jr., but that's the only one, really. And yes, there, and, and there's a very good anti- that many. There's a very good anti-war could... quotation there from him yes. at the memorial. And that yes. is, do you remember it offhand? Or? No, I don't. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> everyone go to Washington, D.C. and go to the war memorials and, and then just see the difference between them and then go to Martin Luther King exactly. Jr.'s and see. Like, that's, we need more of that yeah. in and our And that opinion. came after my trip to Washington with Right, my but son. still, that was, that's one against, <laughs> yeah. yes. Um, Betty Jo, have you got everything said that you'd like to say? Did you want to read a poem or something? Or, just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or did you have a statement you wanted to read? <laughs> I, um, I think it was a statement you might want to read. Uh, no, I had a quotation, but a that's quotation. okay. I, I do want to say thank you so much for having uh, me be a part of this. It's a real honor. I thank the station for um, allowing the subject of peace to be aired. Oh, my gosh. Um, and... If you would like more information about Palestine and about International Women's Peace Service, uh, you can go to IWPS.info and you can find out about us. We are always recruiting women to uh, work in Palestine with us. It is uh, an, a life-changing experience and uh, we need you. Okay, and that's, I think we, you know, I was wondering whether we'd have enough time to cover everything, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> but, you know, one of the things was how much money we invest in the military, and that was just, 
I, it was one, I of the, it. one of the little things. Do you want to just quick say that, what that is? Um, well, I just did this for the, um, the yeah. county that we're in, Hillsborough okay. County. And we give the Department of Defense $1.99 billion a year. Every, you know, the, the citizens, the, citizens, the oh. taxpayers. Two billion. Hillsborough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we might as well say $2 billion. Thank you. Now, with that money, we could uh, open 1,000 Head Start slots, hire 5,000 new elementary teachers, give 30,000 students a scholarship to college, and fit 100,000 homes with renewable energy, and still have $1.4 billion left for the Department of Defense. That is insanity. And if people would come together, in communities and become aware and realize we are the 99 percent mm -hmm. we are the power of the country this would never happen right and that would never you know, allow this and yes and the, and the military things that we've donated we've given like 126 uh, million dollars to russia for weapons and it's just like why are we giving russia weapons of all things but but anyway there's just a lot of statistics mm -hmm. out there that we could talk about we're running out of we're running low of time and i went <laughs> brian i want to give you a, a final word okay uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, just a, a heads up. Remember, the United States government supported apartheid and the South African government during that time. And uh, it was Castro and the Cubans that came over and helped uh, the freedom fighters uh, and uh, Mandela to fight against such uh, oppression. And the irony of it is here now, our president uh, shakes hands with Raul Castro yesterday, and they're making a big deal about it, and yet the, the real <laughs> heroes uh, were, were the freedom fighters, and we, yeah. were, and we were the oppressors, but, and yet we come over and our representative act, acts like, uh, you know, we're going to be part of the kind of celebrating, huh? Oh, kind of yeah, <laughs> whatever, I don't know what yeah. it is. But the moral Good of boy. the story is, is that you know, if we had been leaders 30 years ago or 40 years ago, uh, and we would have been vindicated and done the right thing, but we didn't do the right thing. And a lot of people suffered, and now we're recognizing it or trying to uh, save face. And I just don't think it yeah. works. Yeah, well, at some point we can change this paradigm, and that's what this, this show is about. We hope that it's a good start for everyone to think about um, how you can change paradigm. Um, our platform is at gp.org. So if you want to know more about the Green Party, um, the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation uh, website, one more time. USPeaceMemorial.org. Okay. And International Women's Peace Service, is there a website? IWPS.info. Okay, and you are active in this local area, so right. And we don't have a, a website, but we're, de we're dependent a lot on St. Pete for Peace. They're, they've done a great job in the Tampa area. Very well organized. They group. have a website, stpeteforpeace.com. Very well motivated. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to sign off and uh, say that our next show will be about GMOs. And actually, you know, the food that we eat and what we put into our body has a lot to do with peace as well.